welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. For this month's show, we've traveled down to Midtown Detroit's Cultural University Center to visit the planetariums located here. We'll begin the show here at the Michigan Science Center, so let's head inside. Hello, and welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. We're here today at the Michigan Science Center to tour their planetarium, and to take us on that tour is the planetarium coordinator, Paulette Octung. So, Paulette, where are we going to start today? Uh, we're going to start back in our computer room, so you guys can go, go ahead and follow me. So we're in the computer room, which is sort of like the control center of the planetarium. I'm going to walk you through some of the equipment. Right up over here, we have our time box. Uh, it's our data and time interface, sort of like the brains of the operation. Uh, right down over here, we have our tarragons. These control our slide projectors and our video projectors. Uh, right down over here, we have our uh, nutmegs, which are video and audio interfaces. Uh, these two right here. And these take the video and some of the audio from all of our different sources and from there it goes out to our actual video projectors. You notice that all of these are named after spices so we've got thyme, tarragon, nutmeg, uh, we call this our spice rack which again is the control center of the planetarium. Uh, right down over here we have our video, pro our uh, DVD players and yes we're still using laser discs so right down over here we have our laser disc player. Uh, from here we go to our audio rack. We have our microphones, our microphone mixers. Uh, this is a uh, MIDI box, which takes our soundtracks and actually uh, takes those soundtracks, puts them into 5.1 and allows us to play them through the system. All of our audio actually goes into our mixer right here, our Clove mixer, and from the Clove mixer it goes out into our amplifiers and from there to our many, many speakers. So this computer right here is probably one of the most important computers that we have in the planetarium. This is our Digistar 2 processor. So this is actually what allows us to put stars up onto the dome. So even if all that other equipment fails, as long as we've got this, we've still got a planetarium show. So Paulette, can you tell our viewers about the equipment here at the console? Um, so this box that we have right here is our manual control of the SPICE equipment. Uh, so this controls some of the lights, the slide projectors, and also uh, the audio as well. We can manually control it through this box. Uh, but if we want to automate it and program it in, we have a computer right over here that does our SPICE automation. We can actually sit down, program things out so we can click through the show um, and have it automated. Uh, this computer right over here, our Sun workstation, is the computer that the SPICE computer talks to, to be able to communicate with the Digistar projector. In addition to being the host of this program, I also work here as a planetarium presenter at the Michigan Science Center. And right over here is uh, the uh, main projector for the star field. And Paulette, can you tell our visitors about this piece of equipment? Uh, yes, yeah, so this is the Digistar 2 projector. Uh, a lot of people, when they go to an older planetarium, they're used to seeing that giant star ball in the center, which is actually called a planetarium. That's how the building gets their name. Uh, but right here, we have something a little bit different. This is one of the first digital type projectors. Uh, inside of that projector right there, there's a lot of computers. Uh, and there's also a giant CRT tube that does lines and dots up onto the dome so that we can see stars and so that we can also uh, draw the constellations and the uh, asterisms along with them. All right, so we were back at the console way back over there uh, talking about some of the uh, computer equipment. Then we came down to the pit right over here to talk about our Digistar projector. Uh, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the, the planetarium itself. The planetarium seats uh, 110 people, uh, and it's a 50-foot dome. Uh, you can see that the dome up above us is actually made out of uh, perforated aluminum. That allows for sound to come through the back. You notice there are no speakers inside the dome. Uh, the speakers are all on the outside of it, and so the sound is able to come through that perforated aluminum uh, so that we can hear it in the planetarium. Uh, and it also is 
just the perfect uh, re reflectivity to allow us to be able to see the stars best. Outside the planetarium, there are several illuminated images that our visitors can look as they're waiting for the next planetarium show. In this image, we see the Eagle Nebula. This is part of that nebula, a cloud of dust and gas, a star-forming region within our galaxy. Coming up next is Stephen Witte with Term of the Month. The Michigan Science Center has a display with the scale of the solar system. On the left here we have uh, the sun, and the sun is pictured just as the limb of the sun. It's 700,000 kilometers in diameter, and so it's, it's really quite huge. What's in scale is the distances between the planets from the sun. So Mercury, at 36 million miles, is about 0.4 of the distance between the sun and the Earth. So the Earth is at one astronomical unit from the sun, 93 million miles away. Mercury is at 0.4. Venus is at about 0.7 of one astronomical unit. Mars is one and a half times the distance from the Earth to the sun, one and a half astronomical units. But as you get farther from the sun, the distances get much farther, and so Jupiter is five times the distance of, from the Earth to the Sun. So Jupiter is 400 million miles from the Sun. That's five astronomical units. And so we've walked way out here, and we move over to Saturn, and Saturn is at just about 10 astronomical units out. Saturn's rings are very wide. In fact, they're about as wide as the distance from the Earth to the moon. It's kind of interesting. And then finally, we move over to Uranus. And Uranus is at 19 astronomical units. It's quite a ways out. And yet, we still haven't made it to Neptune. So we've moved quite a bit beyond Uranus here at 19 astronomical units. And now we walk over to Neptune at about 30 astronomical units. It's way out here. It really is, as far as the major planets go, this is the end of the solar system. And beyond Neptune, we have the trans-Neptunian objects, the first of which was discovered in 1930, and we know it as Pluto. In 2006, it was demoted to a dwarf planet, and it is really quite small. Um, and, uh, and it sits here out at about 40 astronomical units on average, although the orbit is quite elliptical, and it sometimes spends time uh, closer to the sun than Neptune, and it is currently heading even farther out into the, you know, deeper into the solar system. So that's the term of the month. That is the scale of the solar system. The term of the month is astronomical unit. For the second part of our program, we've come over to the campus of Wayne State University. We're here in front of Old Main, which houses the planetarium. Let's head inside. We're here in the planetarium inside Old Main at Wayne State University in Midtown Detroit. To tell us all about this wonderful facility, I have with me to my left Rachel Merritt, Jeff Kahn, and Jerry Dunifer. Now, Jeff, why don't you tell our viewers a bit about the brains of the operation here? Okay. Well, essentially our system is a Spitz uh, SciDome HD system installed by Spitz, uh, the digital version, about five years ago. Uh, before that, uh, we'll hear about that a little bit later, we had an optomechanical system again from Spitz uh, that was here for uh, some, uh, say, nearly 15 years. Um, the heart of the matter is the console here, just essentially two computers, uh, Starry Night and what's called a render box. At Starry Night we, we can program and we have programs that we run, uh, and then the render box which of course projects everything up onto the dome. Um, and so that's a little bit about our system. 60, 62 seats and a 27-foot dome. 
Uh, so that's uh, so. Please come down and uh, and enjoy the experience. Rachel, could you please tell our viewers about the programs that you present here at the Planetarium at Wayne State? Absolutely. So probably our most popular program are our weekly public shows, which we do uh, every Friday night at 7, as long as the university is open. And those shows consist of uh, a small demonstration, so something like the Earth-Moon scale, uh, diffraction glasses or rainbow glasses are also very popular. Then that leads us into a current uh, night sky talk. And then we end all of our shows with a full dome film. So for the majority of our shows, they're presented by uh, myself or Jeff or we have other undergraduates and graduate students who uh, work in the planetarium as well and then the end of the show uh, for the film that is something that's pre-recorded uh, one of our most popular movies is probably Black Holes uh, which is narrated by Liam Neeson so I always tease people about after having to listen to me talk for 45 minutes then you get to be soothed by the very smooth voice of Liam Neeson. Uh, in addition to our public shows, we also host a monthly science lecture series called Science Under the Dome, uh, and this is an opportunity for us to present research that's going on at Wayne State and neighboring universities uh, to the general public because as a planetarium outreach is obviously the most important aspect of what we do and so bringing these real science topics that are happening, you know, in things that are above my head as a graduate student to the general public is extremely important to us. Uh, we also, um, every summer, have a summer camp called Camp Cosmos, which runs for the last two weeks of June, and it's meant for junior high students, so 12 to 15 year olds. Uh, a two week day camp, we go from nine in the morning to four in the afternoon. Uh, we bring in faculty to give talks, we take the students on field trips, we have them do introductory labs, not only in physics and astronomy, but we also uh, interact with the geology department, with biology, with chemistry. Uh, and my favorite part of what they get to do is each student picks a topic and then at the end of the two weeks uh, they actually do their own presentation. So it's a way for them to understand, you know, while as a scientist you're constantly learning things, it's also part of your job to teach other people things that you know. So, and one of the things I'm very excited about, uh, I'm not from Michigan originally, I actually moved here a few years ago. Uh, it's always cloudy here, and that's been very hard for me to get used to. But we're hoping that the universe will cooperate a little bit, and we really want to start implementing uh, observation nights on Fridays after our public shows, where we either will take small telescopes just out into uh, the grassy areas of Old Main, or if we have particularly good skies, to go up to the roof of the physics building, uh, where we have our larger scopes inside of domes. So these are all things that we do on a very regular basis and a new thing that I'm very excited and hoping that we'll get to implement in the near future. Thanks, Rachel. We're over here uh, by this very interesting piece of equipment that uh, Jerry is going to fill us in on the history about. So Jerry, take it away. <clears throat> Thank you, Don. Uh, I'm standing by the original projector which was used at the Wayne State Planetarium, and this dates back uh, quite a few decades. This is one of the original projectors, which was made by Spitz Planetarium Company, and it was originally used during the Second World War to train pilots uh, for celestial navigation. After the end of the war, this uh, excellent instrument was donated to Wayne State University, along with a dome that was about 15 feet in diameter or so. Now, this is a very simple design, which, in fact, uh, Albert Einstein uh, made a major contribution. Um, Albert Einstein and Spitz Armand were both Jewish refugees who came over from Germany uh, just before the war. And they would get together from time to time and talk about things. And on one occasion, Armand Spitz was describing how he was trying to make a simple and cheap planetarium projector by using a tin can and a light bulb inside for a source of light. And the geometry didn't work out very well because the can had cylindrical symmetry and the dome, of course, had spherical symmetry. So Einstein said, well, obviously you need to use a sphere and just put little holes in the sphere and the light shining through will all project uh, spots on the dome which represent the stars. But the problem was that was very expensive to make. So Einstein suggested, why don't you do, make an approximation to a sphere which is a pentagonal dodecahedron. This is a solid figure which has 12 sides. Each one is in the shape of a five-sided pentagon. And this is what was done. Um, 12 sides only, and there are a lot of holes. 
uh, through which light can shine and project images up on a dome. And this worked quite well. And so this became the original projector for the Spitz Planetarium Company. Well, many, many years went by, decades in fact, and Spitz had a contest to see where in the world the oldest planetarium projector was being used. And lo and behold, Wayne State University won that contest. And we got a prize. This is our prize, which uh, not much of a prize, but an umbrella, which has uh, the constellations and the stars and the sky. But having received this prize, we thought Wayne State University should do better than having the oldest projector still operational. So uh, Bill Barris, who was the associate chair of the department at that time, and I wrote a joint proposal, which was submitted to the legislature in Lansing, asking for about half a million dollars so we could upgrade. And that probably would not have been approved, except for the fact that at that time, the um, building, Old Main, was being renovated for $42 million. So they tacked our request on top of the big request, and ours looked so small it was immediately approved. And with that, we bought an optomechanical projector along with a much larger dome, the 27-foot dome. And that's where we are. So, Don. Thank you, Jerry. Now, Jeff, as uh, director of the uh, planetarium here at Wayne State, can you tell our audience about some of the uh, special programs that you offer here? Certainly, Don. Thanks so much. Uh, Rachel, uh, as Rachel mentioned, we do, uh, we do shows for public groups, uh, for school kids, etc. Let me describe just a little bit about, uh, about our K-12 shows. Uh, it makes us very popular. In addition, most school groups that come down, very, uh, most school groups that come down, we give a planetarium show and we do our, our fantastic physics demos, all right, which involve a whole series of uh, wonderful demonstrations, including, I might say, our famous fire tornado. All right, the fire tornado has been performed at the uh, Astronomy at the Beach event every year for the last many years. We've done it for large pu other public events in, in combination with astronauts visiting uh, the, the state, et cetera. So, so we're going to give you a demonstration of our famous fire tornado at this point, all right? The idea with the fire tornado is, is this whole business of can conservation of angular momentum. Everybody knows ice skaters as they, as they bring their arms in and their, and their legs in. Okay, they begin to spin faster and faster and faster. Uh, as, as the mass in general around an axis gets closer, the spin rate has to go up, okay, if, for, if some object's rotating. So we're going to demonstrate that sort of thing with a fire tornado. Jerry, Professor Dunifer is, uh, is an expert at this. We've all done this and had a great amount of fun doing this. It is our most popular demonstration. You know, we light a fire. The interesting thing is that the, this is set up so that so that there's a, a gap in the cylinder here and on the other side sort of asymmetrically that way. So as the air comes in, it comes in here and here and it begins to swirl and of course head toward the center. The hot air is rising. Teachers love this. It's all about convection currents in addition to conservation of angular momentum. So the hot air, the hot air rises. The colder air is coming in from here and here creating a spin this way and you can see the fire beginning to twist and little by little by little it goes faster and faster and faster as the ice skater would spin up. The fire spins up and voila, the famous fire tornado. Absolutely spectacular. Now we can't let it go too long, but we can, we can increase the, the flow a bit. That's the incredible fire tornado. There you go. Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> anyway, much fun, okay? And school groups love it, teachers love it, what we do. It's part of the, it's, it's actually a big part of what makes the, the Wayne State Planetarium so special. Programs that uh, Rachel directs now, the summer camp, and our school group programs, um, where we let the kids interact and learn all about science. And that's our famous Wayne State fire tornado. And with that, I'll pass it back to uh, Don. Don, thank you so much. Jeff, you're welcome. I would like to thank all three of our hosts here at the Wayne State University Planetarium. And coming up next is our own Stephen Witte with What's Up in the Night Sky.
Thanks, Don. So what's up in the night sky for January 2016, the new year? So the days are getting longer. They're pretty short because we just had the solstice um, that's in the northern hemisphere. We uh, start the month off with a third quarter moon on the 1st of January. Um, remember that because we'll be getting back to it. On January 9th, we have the new moon. On the 16th, we have the first quarter. On the 23rd, we have the full moon. And then on the 31st, we have the third quarter moon again. So it's kind of an odd sort of month for doubles. Uh, Mercury also has kind of a weird double thing going on. So we start out the month. Here is Mercury at uh, on the first of uh, the month at 6 p.m. So this is just after sunset. And uh, so you can see it uh, close to the horizon in the western, uh, you know, in the west just after sunset. Um, but we move forward to the end of the month and we have Mercury again in the morning. We had inferior conjunction, that's when Mercury comes between the sun and the earth on the 14th. So we've got this kind of weird thing where you can see Mercury in the evening and in the morning in the same month. Um, Venus, Saturn, Mercury, and Mars are visible in a string. If you look up high enough, you can probably see Jupiter as well. But certainly those four um, all in the morning at 6.45 in the morning here on the, on the 31st of, um, uh, of January. Um, Saturn and Venus cross very close to each other, incredibly close to each other, on the night of the 7th at 11 p.m. for Michigan time. Uh, uh, it is at 4.12 in the morning universal time on the 8th. So we've got some date and time changes here going on. Um, five minutes of arc apart. They're very, very close. Then we move on to uh, Mars and Jupiter. So you can see Mars and Jupiter together. This is at 3 a.m. And, uh, uh, you know, they're both very bright and uh, they're both gorgeous. Uh, as the spring moves on, uh, these will become evening objects. They get, you know, that's the direction that they all move. And then finally, Uranus and Neptune are uh, heading toward the sun, um, uh, you know, in the evening sun. You know, they're heading toward sunset. Um, we lose uh, Neptune certainly uh, in superior conjunction uh, at the end of February. So we're getting uh, close to that. And so um, uh, Uranus and Neptune and Vesta is also in that field uh, as it has been since the summer. Uh, we don't have a picture of Pluto because Pluto had its, uh, had, has its superior conjunction, that's when it's on the other side of the sun from us, on the 5th of January. So uh, this is not a very good month to look at Pluto. Uh, summer months like uh, July is my favorite for looking at Pluto. Um, this date changes, by the way, about two days a year if Pluto has such a slow orbit. And that is what's up in the night sky for January 2016. Uh, keep looking up. It's the greatest free show above your head every single night. Mm -hmm.